Yes, nothing is stopping us now. Ekiti is on the move again. Hello and welcome. This is Ekiti on the move, a weekly program that highlights the giant strides of the administration of Dr. Kyle Defiemi in Ekiti State, a program of stewardship about the progress already made in the restoration agenda of the administration in making Ekiti the reference point of good governance development and preferred destination for business and investment. Every week on this program, we'll be bringing for your viewing pleasure highlights of programs, projects, policies, and other activities of government in Ekiti State to keep you abreast of developments in the land of honor and integrity. I am Tunji Salu. Let's have some quick takes for this week. Welcome back, and now to our focus this week. Today, we will be looking at the restoration journey of the Ekiti State Government since the inception of the administration in October 2018. That was October 16, 2018, at the inauguration of Dr. Kayo de Fayami as the governor of Ekiti State for the second time. When the land reclaimed at the polls, the tax I had was daunting, as the intervening four years of previous administration, now regarded as the low-cost years in the state, halted a state that was before then on a trajectory of development and sustainable economy. Reversing the gains being made in human capital development, accelerated infrastructure development, social investments, ongoing business concerns, and many more. Even the civil service, that is the engine of government, was brought to its knees, debased by an administration bereaved of vision. Never again, if you go to my inaugural speech, you will find this very rhetorical never again must we find ourselves in a situation of being a people without character. Never again must we find ourselves in a situation where our students are charged to go to school, that they should go for free. Never again with our health institutions not serve the vulnerable and the weak and never again must we find ourselves in a situation where we cannot be transparent and accountable to the people who elected us in the office. And I then stated my agenda for transformation in Ekiti State. And that set the tone for the new administration in actualizing the second part of its campaign mantra, restoring our values. We are people of values. With people of antecedents, and when you speak to an average person about who we are, we are hardy, we are principled, we have integrity, we love education, we are very focused on aspirations. These are the things we were known for. But in the higher talks between the time I was in office, 
2010 to 2014. And the time I came back to office, we had also become known for anything goes. We had become the state of stomach infrastructure. We had become a people without a sense of self-worth, a people without a sense of value. And my campaign mantra resonated very strongly with the average Akiti person who had also been assaulted and whose reputation had been solid in that period I spoke about. So it wasn't difficult to convince people of the need to reclaim our land. This is encapsulated in the five pillars of the administration as the focal point of the restoration agenda. They are governance, agriculture and rural development, social investments, knowledge economy and infrastructure and industrial development. All of these pillars are distilled from a carefully thought out vision of announcing the potentials of an abundant greenfield state to build an economy that is forward looking and responsive to the challenges of the 21st century. Over the last 18 months, that's what we have followed as much as possible the ethos undergirding our administration is one of values reorientation, is one of practical delivery, and is one of accountable governance in those five pillars that I identified. Elevating governance to a pillar of administration and the very first at that is in tandem with the pedigree and renown of Governor Kayo de Fayemi as a transparent and development-focused leader. Setting up the governance structure became expedient not only for the smooth running of government but for purposes of accountability, delivering on promises to the people and prudent management of state scarce resources. Organs of government, like the State Executive Council, Bureau of Public Procurement, Office of Transformation, Strategy and Delivery, among others, were quickly set up to enhance governance. The first thing we did is to introduce TSA. You know, this is, this, this, if a government doesn't want to be transparent, you cannot do TSA. So we introduced the Treasury single account to the state, which allows the government to have an helicopter bill of the finances of the state. Then, reforms in the Board of Internal Revenues, before people are doing cash-based transactions, everything has been automated, you know, these are reforms that speak to accountability. And at the same time, Mr. Governor has also looked into the approval thresholds of all the ministries to ensure that there's no spurious approvals. So, and also we set up the Office of, Trans uh, of uh, OTSD. That one was put in place in his first time in office. But when the Sosin Governor came, they did not, they just rested, they did not, they, they didn't scrap it, but it was rested. Then that one has received a new lifestyle. And there are a lot of executive orders in the judiciary, and there are a lot of reforms in the judiciary, in the, in the legislatures, to show that the government is transparent. And one of these is the Freedom of Information Bill, which, which we which is signed in, in the first time in office. Then we also, we, we've, we've enlisted into the Open Governance, open, open governance Partnership, which allows a Kitty state to throw itself open to the whole world to see. So if a government doesn't want to be transparent, you cannot, you, you, you can't do an OGP. So we have done that. And uh, so far, so good. We are receiving accolades from far and wide on all this. To get everyone on the same page, as soon as the members of the State Executive Council were inaugurated, the governor organized a week-long retreat at Iloko, Oshun State, where the policy thrust, strategy, and administration's focus were clearly explained to the newly appointed state officials. A policy document named JKF 2.0 Strategic Mandate was produced by each member of the council was made to sign a performance bond as part of the measures to ensure that the overall objectives of the government were actualized. The civil service is widely regarded as the engine room of government and a repository of knowledge of diverse kind aimed at helping a government succeed in its endeavors. But the civil service inherited by the Fiamme administration was far from all these. Having endured four years of executive lawlessness, it had become ill-motivated 
unauthorized civil service occasioned by non-payment of salaries and other emoluments, uninspiring work environment and insecurity. The status quo had to change for a government that is poised to restore values. The money of the service was gone. So there was the need to actually recalibrate the service and still hope in them to create institutions and structures that can deliver on the agenda of government. So the first thing the government did is to restore hope to the workforce. The governor himself would say that payments of salaries is not something that any government should take with levity, that it is a duty, that he holds it a duty to ensure that workers are paid. So one thing that is clear is that salaries are being paid as and when due. And this encouraged the workers, it motivated them. And also, attention is now being paid to staff training and development. There's a saying that if you don't train them, don't blame them. This administration created an office, Office of Capacity Development and Reforms. So exclusively, the mandate is clear to take care of capacity building of workers. And I can happily say here that over 1,200 officers went through local and international training programs. The most important reason why we are here and why this is an interactive session is really that I have come to listen to you as workers. Having an interactive forum with the workers has also helped a long way in bridging the gap between the workers and the government. Regularly, quarterly, the governor will take the time to sit with the workers, listen to them, identify and empathize with them in terms of challenges, and also give them promises and assurances that all their agitations within the limited resources of government will be taken care of. And this has given the workers a sense of belonging. And when you know that your, your leader, despite his very busy schedule, could slow down and listen to their agitations, it has really enhanced the robust relationship Agriculture and rural development as a pillar of administration in the current dispensation feeds so squally into the fame of Ikiti as a predominantly agrarian society. Its vast land suitable for cultivation of diverse crops, both catch and food, capacity to generate massive employment down the value chain and potential to attract agro-allied industries looking for green feed opportunities all recommend agri as a sustainable feed for development. However, for the fireman-led administration, it is no longer agriculture for subsistence, but agriculture for wealth creation. It's not subsistence farming that will take us to where we want to go. It is commercial farming that empowers our outgrowers and that ensures that there is an off-taker automatically ready to collect what they produce from the farm so that they make their money as local farmers, and we also develop a processing base. So when we attract Promacido here to come and help us revive our moribund dairy farm to produce 10,000 liters of milk daily, or Dangote farms, or JMK to put rice mills there, or Promise Point, and FMS farms to put cassava mills in our agri-processing zone. We, we have a clear vision of where we're going. As we speak, a World Bank-assisted 1,000-kilometer rural roads project to facilitate access to agri products and marketing is underway across the state, i.e. over 1,500 hectares of land 
have been cleared for allocation to interested investors in agri business. Just as envisaged and in less than two years of reinforcing this pillar, the dividends are becoming apparent. So if you do like 20, that, that would be revolutionary. Yes. In a kitty, it is called Warubo, a monthly stipend in form of social safety net for the elderly, which has since become a national template for social investment programs. It was instituted during Governor Fireman's first term in office in 2010 and is back in the current administration. One of the popular sayings of the governor is, our greatest resource remains our people and only our healthy and enlightened people can drive the sustainable development we want to see in Ekiti State. Little wonder then that its administration pays premium attention to the well-being of Ekiti people, irrespective of their status or calling. Other aspects of the social investment include health and human services, education, youth empowerment, and social security to the senior citizens in various ways. All these are some of the efforts geared towards uplifting the dignity of the equity person. We've always been strong on protection of the vulnerable and the weak in our state. That has been our mantra from my first time in office. That's why we were the state that introduced stipend for the old, the volunteer youth scheme that we started here, that later became NPOWER, uh, uh, in our policy uh, uh, at the federal level. A number of these things have come out of it, but that comes from a fundamental, ideological, philosophical principles that those of us who are fortunate have a duty to protect the weak and the vulnerable. People are not poor because God made them poor. It is equality of opportunity and access that privileges some over the others. Not necessarily that I have more brain power than that old school mate of mine who did not have the opportunity that I have. So our duty is to ensure that we do as much as possible to promote equality of access. It is not for mere symbolism that Ekiti State is referred to as Fountain of Knowledge. The penchant of the people for learning and scholarship has distinguished them as perhaps the most educated group per capita in the country. The state parades the highest number of professors and other academic pioneers per capita in Nigeria, as well as leading lights in every field of human endeavor across the globe. However, for this administration, it is about time to convert the knowledge advantage to a sustainable economy with the creation of Ekiti Knowledge Zone, a quadrangle of educational institutions driven by cutting-edge technology to engage in research, skill development, creative arts, and promotion of entrepreneurship. No wonder the first executive order signed by Governor Fayemi shortly after taking over in October 2018 was the abrogation of levies on education tax imposed and school children by his predecessor in office. The last one year has seen massive investment in school infrastructure and teaching materials, training and retraining of teachers, payment of running grants and subventions to schools from primary to tertiary institutions, refocus and retooling of technical education. In fact, within this period, the State University Medical School, for the first time, got graduated its first set of medical doctors after about 10 years. It's not just enough to have brilliant Ekiti sons and daughters who have accomplished in the medical field, but it is also to put in a an enabling environment for such people to practice their arts and science in equity. And that's where the idea of a knowledge zone comes from.
which is a zone, a free trade zone that provides the infrastructure for equity people to practice and even other global players to make equity a destination of choice when it comes to business outsourcing, when it comes to technological innovation, when it comes to biomedical practices, when it comes to agri-technology and such other initiatives that can catapult the state ahead of others. I mean, when you hear that we're focusing more on laying 606 kilometers of fiber optic cable, we're not just doing that for the sake of it. We know the multiplier effect of broadband penetration and COVID-19 has even brought it to the fore. What, why technology is going to be so critical to transformation in future. And we're getting first off the block in our state. Perhaps no other steps are imposed the commitment of the administration to building a Vara economy out of its knowledge potentials than the recent crashing of the right of way fees paid by telecoms company in the state from 4,500 naira to 145 naira per meter. Governor Fireman, through Executive Order 007 of 2020, has again put a kitty on the super highway of broadband penetration with its attendant impact on new jobs and businesses, digital education, tech innovation, improved access to quality earth, etc. Ekiti State was the first to comply with this national directive and a commitment to improving ease of doing business and attracting investors to the state. The last but definitely not the least of the five pillars of administration is infrastructure and industrial development. A pivotal pillar to investment attraction, wealth creation, and economic prosperity of the Akiti State, which foundation was laid in the first term in office of Governor Fiamme. Many legacy projects and business concerns aimed at jobstarting the state's industrial growth were already afoot before the succeeding regime happened on the state and development, not only stood still, but refreshed for four years the pictures tell the sad story. As painful as the developments were in 2018, the new administration was poised to salvage the ruins, promising to revisit the technical and commercial viability of the abandoned and run-down infrastructure and businesses. It is a different story already for many of the projects. opportunity to do a lot more to improve on the infrastructure of our state. Whether we're talking of broadband access, or we're talking of road network, or we're talking of ensuring that we have pipe bomb water and electricity, and in all of these areas we're working. We're working on independent power projects, we're working on uh, restoring water to the taps in, in, in Ekiti by resuscitating all our old dams. We're fixing pipes across the length and breadth of the state. We're building additional uh, water projects for irrigation in the agricultural sphere. So all of these things, we know that 
equity people are hardworking. We just need to make this environment more conducive, make it more enabling for them to thrive. And you remember what I said in that inaugural speech, that by the time I'm leaving, I want this place to be a place to work, to live, and to play. Wow, the restoration agenda is ongoing and in full throttle in Ekita State and every week we will be letting you into how the vision is being achieved through purposeful leadership and consistent hard work. Before we go this week, let's take a look at Ekiti Fact File. <laughs> That's Ekiti on the move for this week. You can watch this episode and subsequent editions on our YouTube channel showing on your screen. You can also interact with us on our other social media platforms. Thanks for watching. See you next time.